This question will walk through the calculation of diluted earnings per share. On January 1st, 2020, James Bond Inc. issued 4 million of face value five year 6% bonds at par. Each $1,000 bond is convertible into 20 common shares. James Bond's net income in 2020 was 200,000 and its tax rate was 25%. The company had 100,000 common shares outstanding throughout 2020. None of the bonds were exercised in 2020. For simplicity, ignore the requirement to record the bonds debt and equity components separately. And the first thing we're asked to do is calculate earnings per share for the year ended December 31st, 2020. So what do you think about this statement here that says none of the bonds were exercised in 2020? How does that impact the calculation of our diluted earnings per share? You're right, it doesn't impact it because the, we calculate diluted earnings per share on a what if method. It means that even though these bonds are not being converted into equity, the what if method says if they were converted at the soonest possible point that they could be, this is what would happen to earnings per share. So when we, it asks us to calculate diluted earnings per share, but we really need to give some thought to this whole concept of what's diluted and what's anti-diluted. Remember that if, that if our diluted earnings per share is higher than our basic earnings per share, we'll show the same number for basic and diluted earnings per share. We'll never show a higher number for diluted earnings per share, even if that's what would actually happen. That's just not acceptable. Diluted earnings per share has to be lower. So if it actually is higher in after we calculate it, then we just show the same number as basic. So let's first say, okay, let's just start by calculating out basic earnings per share as our starting point. So we're gonna have net income minus preferred dividends that are either declared or cumulative. And then we're gonna have our weighted average common shares. So our basic, EP, our basic earnings per share is gonna be their net income was, 200,000. Do we have any preferred share dividends? We have a we have an hybrid instrument for sure. I don't see any preferred share dividends, so this is zero. And it says we're gonna have 100,000 common shares outstanding throughout 2020. So again, they say the 100,000 was outstanding throughout 2020, meaning there was no change in the number of shares, which is nice. It means we don't have to calculate the weighted average number of shares like some of the other questions that we saw where there were a whole bunch of different share transactions and we needed to spend quite a bit of time calculating the denominator. So this is gonna give us a basic earnings per share of $2 per share. Now, what would happen if the bonds were converted into common shares? So we know that we need to adjust both net income and the weighted average number of shares because they're both gonna change if a hybrid instrument is converted the income is going to change because if the instrument was equity, we wouldn't have had to pay out interest on the debt. So we're going to have some savings. We're going to have a higher net income because we won't have to pay the, out that interest expense. And of course, because we've issued more common shares, we're going to have more common shares outstanding. So it says that there are 4 million base value, five year 6% bonds. And there, it says they're at par somewhere. James Bond issued 4 million face value, five year 6% bonds at par. And this at par is really important because it means that we don't have a discount or a premium. It means that we can simply take the 4 million and the 6% interest as our interest expense. As you remember, interest expense is the same under the effective interest method if you have bonds at par and that means that your market rate and the interest rate on the bonds are the same. So there's no discount or uh, premium to amortize. So that's really important. That means we can take the 6%. So if the bonds were converted, if bonds were converted, we're gonna have 4 million, or change to net income. It's gonna be the $4 million face of the bond times 6% times one minus the tax rate. And it says the tax rate is 25%. I broke these out into some more calculations last time, but sometimes it's good if you write it out this way because you wanna make sure 
really important not to forget the tax rate because we're adjusting net income, which is an after tax number. So we have to take account, take into account the tax that we would pay on the savings because the amount that we would earn would be taxable. Therefore, we have to apply the tax to it because we're adding it to an after tax number. This is going to give us 180,000, which is going to be our add to net income. And how many common additional common shares would we issue? Change to common shares is so we're going to have 4 million. James Wine issued 4 million face value five year bonds, each $1,000 bond. So there's 4 million bonds and they have a $1,000 face. So we've got 4 million. 4 million, sorry. And just hang on, 4 million, uh, each bond is convertible into 20 common shares. Each $1,000 bond is convertible into 20 shares. So we're gonna say, okay, so 4,000 divided by 1,000 base value is gonna give us 4,000 bonds. We need to make sure we realize this is all the bonds, but how many bonds are there? Well, they each have a thousand dollar face. So that means there's 4,000 bonds and they're each gonna get converted into 20 common shares, which means that we're gonna increase our common shares by 80,000. So let's calculate our diluted, diluted EPS. So we're gonna have net adjusted net income minus preferred share dividends divided by adjusted weighted average common shares. So we're gonna have our net income before was 200,000. And now we're gonna add back, where's our add back here? 180,000. That's a pretty big add back. We're almost doubling our net income. There's no preferred share dividends and our shares outstanding before were 100,000. And now we're gonna have to add 80,000. So remember, we're just adding to our basic EPS. We're not just calculating it on the difference, it's the whole thing. And that is gonna give us earnings per share of 2.11. Okay, are we done? Well, let's take a look here. This is our diluted earnings per share, 211. And what was our basic earnings per share? $2. That is a big problem. So our basic earnings per share always has to be higher than our diluted earnings per share. And what's going to happen is that when these bonds are converted into common shares, we're actually going to have a better earnings per share. We can't show that. Diluted earnings per share is a, is a what if scenario, and it has to be a bad case scenario. So this is a big problem. This is called anti-dilutive, which means it's going to actually improve our earnings per share. It's not going to dilute them or make them water them down. It's going to actually improve it. So therefore, we cannot show it. So what are we going to do? What we're going to do is we're going to say basic earnings per share were $2, right? And guess what? Our diluted we are still going to show our diluted earnings per share, and we're actually going to say it's $2 as well, and that's it. So we change this number. Rather than saying it's 211, we report the same number as the basic EPS because we cannot show a, an improvement in our earnings per share on a diluted basis, even though that's what will happen when these, when these, um, when these, what are they, bonds are converted into equity, we will actually improve our earnings per share. That can't be reported in the financial statements under IFRS. Remember, ASPE doesn't show any guidance for um, earnings per share, so this is all IFRS guidance. So therefore, we still have to report diluted earnings per share, but we're going to show it at the same amount as the basic earnings per share. Basically, overrides the fact that earnings per share was higher. So something really important to watch for, you still go through all the calculations and then you always wanna make sure that your basic earnings per share is higher than your diluted earnings per share. 
If it isn't, if diluted earnings per share is higher, then we're going to simply report the same basic earnings per share as the diluted earnings per share. 